my first encounter with Dan was uh, in these beautiful surroundings um, in the ICOLS meeting in 1981 in Jasper Park in Canada. And I was out jogging early one morning and I saw this lone figure jogging on the other side of the lake and uh, I thought, well, if Dan jogs, he must be a good kind of guy. So, <laughs> um, so uh, Dan then gave a great talk on, uh, we heard a lot about today, uh, on turning off the vacuum, uh, inhibited spontaneous emission, which uh, has been mentioned earlier on several times. Um, as the years rolled by, we grew to admire and respect Dan very much, not only as a, a fantastic physicist, but also as a great scientific leader. Um, and in particular, I think we came to admire him for the way he looked after his group so well and the new centre uh, when it was set up. And when I had the opportunity to start a new lab about 12 years ago, and I couldn't help but feel that it would be great to try and emulate Dan. And as a result of that, um, when I was in Palermo, I uh, bought this mug mainly just to remind me of Dan. So thank you, Dan. <laughs> so the topic of my talk, Bragg spectroscopy of ultra-cold Fermi gas, um, I'd like to acknowledge the people who have contributed mainly to this project, in particular, Sasha Hoinker, who's just finishing his PhD and all the latest results have been largely due to his work. Um, Eva Kuhnler, who uh, preceded Sasha and is now in Heidelberg doing a postdoc. Uh, Hui Hu, who has provided a lot of the theory uh, that's made this work possible. And of course, Chris Vale, who is the uh, team leader and has led this project uh, admirably over the last few years. Just a little bit about Bragg spectroscopy. Um, if we start off with an atomic cloud here and illuminate the cloud with a moving one-dimensional standing wave or one-dimensional optical lattice, I'm sorry, optical lattice, um, and the two beams here have a very small frequency difference, omega, which we can tune. Um, I should say that uh, Bragg spectroscopy has been used a lot on bosonic condensates at MIT and in Israel, first of all. Uh, but this work, we're using these techniques for fermionic clouds and fermionic condensates. So the idea is um, the Bragg condition or the resonance condition, we, we Bragg scatter atoms or molecules or pairs by selecting the value of the frequency difference, omega, between these two beams. And uh, the Bragg condition uh, here uh, is determined by the mass of the particles that are scattering. And for the case of, for the case of atoms, uh, a typical value uh, depending a little bit on the geometry, is 290 kilohertz, whereas for, the mole for molecules or paired atoms, it's a factor of two smaller. So we can immediately select out uh, the particles which are being scattered. So here we show um, an uns the unscattered cloud, and after Bragg scattering, we see uh, a small uh, amount of vapour here being a slice being removed, and the reason you don't see <laughs> where the slice came from is because of all the interactions, elastic uh, collisions and so on, which take place in the main, uh, in the main cloud. So, um, Bragg scattering reflects the composition of the gas, the mass. Uh, we can vary the momentum, and we can transfer quite a large momentum, greater than uh, H uh, greater than the Fermi momentum, and this provides access to a broad region of the excitation spectrum. Uh, 
this sort of you cannot do with radio frequency spectroscopy, for example, and there's no change in the internal state. Um, the lithium, the work is done in lithium-6, which has this beautiful feshback resonance at 833 Gauss. Um, it's a broad feshback resonance. Uh, we show here with uh, we have positive scattering lengths and going through zero down to negative scattering lengths. And uh, we have spin-up and spin-down particles uh, here determined by these quantities. So um, just a little bit about the BC-BCS crossover where we go from bound bosonic molecules to free fermionic atoms. Um, in ultra-cold Fermi gases uh, like lithium-6, this provides a, a very nice model system to study fermionic pairing uh, and superfluidity. Um, as you go through uh, this region of unitarity from BC bound molecules here to uh, BCS, where you have long-range um, fermi uh, fermionic pairs, for example. So the experiment, um, we cool a 50-50 mixture of lithium-6 atoms in an optical dipole trap near the feshback resonance, um, typically 3 by 10 to the 5th uh, atoms in each of the spin states, temperatures uh, less than about equal to 0.1 of the Fermi temperature. We have been down, the lowest temperature is about 0.06. We apply Bragg beams, uh, crossing at approximately 90 degrees, about 83 degrees, typically, uh, interacting with the lithium atoms in this glass cell. Um, Bragg spectrum uh, for lithium-6, we, we measure the observable is the centre of mass displacement, which occurs due to the transfer of momentum uh, to the atoms or molecules. And we plot this versus the Bragg frequency omega along the x-axis. Uh, so we see uh, the molecular BEC, we see a high peak here uh, at, these at this value of the magnetic field on the BEC, BEC side uh, of the feshback resonance. Uh, and then on the single atom side, on the BCS side, we see a, a broader uh, resonance here corresponding to something close to an ideal Fermi gas we've plotted in here. Looking in more detail, as we go through from the molecular BC side, centred at this frequency, about 150 kilohertz, to the BCS side, centred at about 300 kilohertz. Um, and in particular, as we go through the crossover, about 8.35 here, we can see that, um, well, first of all, it's a, a smooth uh, transition through the crossover, uh, and at the crossover, we still have this pairing peak here, which gradually disappears as we go further away from the crossover. So I'd like to say just a little bit about structure factors that uh, we actually determine. Um, first of all, the dynamic structure factor characterises the spatio uh, temporal correlations between particles. Um, and then the static structure factor is just the, we integrate over the, the dynamic structure factor and this is proportional to our observable, which is the displacement of the centre of mass. And we normalise using an F-sum rule, which is effectively just conservation of particles, and taking a ratio uh, of the normalisation and the, uh, this part here, we get uh, S of K, which in terms of very simple, well-known quantities, the recoil energy, uh, and it's independent of N, the number of atoms, which cancels out in the 
numerator and denominator and independent of the Rabi frequency. So this gives us a, an accurate way of uh, determining the, in this case, the static structure factor. So uh, the results come out like this. Uh, in an experiment, we actually measure the, the total structure factor, and this consists of two components, the, uh, the parallel spin component and the anti-parallel spin component. At the high momenta that we use, typically uh, five times the Fermi momentum, uh, there, is no, th there is no correlation between the particles with parallel spins, and this just goes to unity, and so we get this simple relationship enabling us to determine S of uh, the anti-parallel spin case. Uh, we find that the, the static structure factor decays from about approximately two, corresponding to bound molecules out here, uh, down through the crossover, down to uh, unity, corresponding to uncorrelated atoms as we go through the crossover, changing the interaction strength. Um, and this is in agreement with uh, the latest theory for Hui Hu was produced for T equals naught Gaussian pair fluctuation uh, theory given by the solid curve. Um, now I'd like to just talk about, a little bit about uh, universality um, for sufficiently strong interactions, all dilute Fermi systems behave uh, identically on a scale given by the, the mean particle separation here, uh, independent of the details of the potential, independent of, say, R0. Um, and for strongly interacting Fermi gases, it's determined mainly by, or almost entirely by, the separation of the particles. Uh, Strongly interacting Fermi gases traditionally have been uh, a, real, a theoretical challenge, a significant theoretical challenge. In uh, 2005, Tan made significant progress by deriving several exact relations for uh, Fermi gases in this crossover region by recognising that R0 uh, is always a small parameter. Uh, these relations apply in a very broad range of circumstances, as I've listed here, and just to summarise, uh, related work in theory and, uh, and in experiment. So, uh, Tan's work invokes this single parameter, which is called the contact, defined here in terms of uh, K, the momentum, and uh, the, the uh, density, which encapsulates all the information required to determine the many body properties of the system. So this is very similar to what Martin showed. On the BC side, we have mainly bound molecules. Uh, on the BCS side, we have long-range Cooper pairs, uh, which are correlated in momentum. In unitarity region, we have uh, a mixture or uh, different smaller separation here. So I quantifies the likelihood of finding two fermions of opposite spin close enough to interact with each other. And in, in particular, it depends on the interaction and on the temperature. At high momentum, uh, the, static factor, the static structure factor follows a simple relation uh, given by the Fourier transform of G2. Um, by this relation, where G of 2 is related to the contact, this is what uh, Tan showed, and then if you take a Fourier transform of that, you get for, this, uh, for the static structure factor, uh, this relationship uh, in terms of the contact and inversely proportional to the momentum, this is close to unitarity, close to the centre of the feshback resonance. When you're exactly on unitarity, this term goes to zero, and you're left with this very simple linear dependence. With a static structure depend, depending li linearly on the contact and inversely proportional to the momentum. Uh, so, experimental results. Um, this shows the, stru uh, the static structure factor as a function of one on the momentum k, 
Um, for three values of the interaction, on unitarity, where 1 on K of A is 0, uh, and here on the uh, BC side, and here on the BCS side. And um, just comparing with theory, um, there is very good agreement here. Um, first of all, we see a linear relationship with a slope slightly different from that predicted by um, Hui Hu. Um, and on the BC side, we, we see good agreement, which you can see slight curvature here due to the contribution of the second term in the expression I showed, um, due to this contribution here. And uh, along this line, you see a slight bending upwards. So the dashed line here is the experimental slope, which is 0.75, compared with the theory slope of 0.81. And I just realised on the way over here that uh, we now have a new experimental value for the contact of 3.06, uh, which has, that now introduces a slope which is in perfect agreement with the theory. It means that uh, these other two curves will be maybe slightly off. So uh, that's looking very satisfactory. Uh, there's no free parameters whatsoever other than the value of the contact which we've measured. So this verifies TAN's universal uh, relationship involving the static structure factor very nicely. Um, the temperature dependence of the contact is also very important. Um, this shows measurements of the contact uh, versus temperature here in units of the Fermi temperature. Uh, as we go to lower and lower temperatures, uh, this line here indicates the uh, approximately the critical temperature for superfluidity. Um, so we see uh, quite a, a large increase here prior to this critical temperature, um, and then it flattens off. The data still isn't accurate enough to be able to distinguish between uh, various theory results. But the agreement at this stage is, is very good. Um, some very recent measurements. Uh, the previous measurements were done in a trapped gas. Um, the most recent measurements have uh, been able to convert to, uh, by spatially resolving the trap to a homogeneous gas or something approaching a homogeneous gas. And we see, um, as we reduce the temperature down and down and down, uh, a gradual slope and then it really takes off here. And that takes off about the, the value for the critical temperature. And we believe this is a, a signature of fermionic superfluidity that's taking off here. Note how different it is compared with an ideal Fermi gas, which is predicted to look like this. Um, very recently, been able to improve the, uh, the accuracy of the measurements um, of the contact and uh, of the structure factors, and uh, these have allowed very precise measurements of the contact. Uh, this data is now, this is right on uh, unitarity, so we can see the the pairing peak very nicely and the single atom peak here. The error bars have been reduced substantially from compared with our earlier results. And um, this shows precision measurements of the contact. The latest values now are on unitarity. We get this value, new value of 3.08 plus or minus 0.08. Um, and um, on the BCS side, I'm sorry, on the, on the BC side, um, uh, it fits in here nicely too. The error bars are very small now. So the values that come out of this work uh, from Bragg spectroscopy, the new value is 3.06 plus or minus 0.08, which we call a precision measurement, um, taking a temperature 0.08 of the Fermi temperature. Um, this is for a trap gas. Converting this result to a homogeneous gas uh, increases it to 3.17 uh, and allowing comparisons with theory, theory values, which I show here, um, down here. So um, this 
good, uh, good agreement with the T-matrix calculations from Munich and Camerino, but not so good with the theory values from our lab. And uh, these are from Los Alamos. I'd like, now like to move on the remaining time to measurements of the dynamic spin response. Up until now, I've been talking about the density-density response. We now I, uh, like to just talk about the spin response, and in particular for the dynamic structure factor. So, um, in a spin-balanced two-component Fermi gas, the, the density and spin dynamic structure factors are given by the following, where you get a plus, this is for the spin parallel and spin anti-parallel, and the plus refers to the density, and the minus refers to the spin. So this is like a, a magnetic term for the spin. Um, the Bragg response in terms of the spin parallel and spin anti-parallel components, given by an expression proportional to, to this quantity, Delta here, delta, uh, is, this is a detuning from spin down and this is detuning from spin up uh, of the Bragg, the Bragg beams, the detuning. And uh, we have here the spin parallel term and spin anti-parallel term. And it's possible now to separate these two components by, uh, you, we can select the density component by setting the detunings approximately equal and large compared with the hyperfine splitting in the ground state. Or we can, sit, we, can, uh, we can select the spin component by setting the, um, the two detunings, one, e uh, one equal to the negative of the other detuning, and equal to about half the hyperfine splitting, as we show here. Hyperfine splitting is about 80 megahertz. So we set uh, the detuning equal to plus or minus about 40 megahertz to get for the spin component. And for the density component, we set the um, detunings large compared with this hyperfine splitting. The spin channel leads to spontaneous emission, but it's possible to overcome this by, uh, or just checking to work in the linear response range by uh, being very careful to use low enough Bragg frequency intensities so you don't get significant spontaneous emission. So the results we get, um, the dashed lines here correspond to the, the dynamic spin structure factors. This is the dynamic structure factor along here in units of one on the number, particle number, versus omega in units of the recoil uh, omega. Um, for two different values uh, of the interaction, this is at unitarity and... Um, at, on the BC side, uh, this is 1 on Ka equal 1. Um, so the spin, the, the, the density structure factors are the dashed lines here, and the spin uh, dynamic structure factors are the points. And for comparison, we show an ideal Fermi gas by this dotted line here. So it's possible to convert this information to separate out the, the spin parallel component from the spin anti-parallel component. This shows the dynamic structure factor for these two components uh, as we vary the Bragg frequency. Um, so um, this is for at unitarity and on the, B, the BEC side. So on the close to the uh, the molecular side or the the uh, where you have pairing, um, the two components that spin parallel and anti-parallel are very much the same. But then, as you get further away, as you increase the Bragg frequency, the the two become very different. The spin up, uh, the uh, spin parallel and the spin anti-parallel. And in particular, we even see a negative contribution here, which um, is, is necessary for the sum, to satisfy the sum rule to, um, to balance out what's on the positive side.
at the high frequency end, one minute, okay, um, we see the dependence on um, omega to the minus five halves as, uh, as we might expect from, from the theory. So from the spin Bragg spectroscopy, we can obtain the individual spin stru st static structure factors, as I've summarized here. Um, these ones, the spin parallels should be unity, and they're consistent with the unity. Um, that is no correlation for high momenta. And then the spin anti-parallel factors uh, are given here. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> So you showed um, beautifully how the contact uh, seems to uh, jump quite rapidly uh, as you cross, um, as you go to lower temperatures. Uh, roughly where we saw the superfluid transition in our thermodynamic data, you see the contact jump up. Does that mean uh, that the, the, the uh, spin up, spin downs, due to pairing, uh, they, they like to be a little bit closer together than in the normal phase? Is that the interpretation or how do you picture what's happening in the gas? Is this for the spin, the spin dynamic factor? Or? Yeah, the local, uh, the local contact versus uh, temperature that you showed. Oh. It, it showed this beautiful right. yes, yes. rise yes. Uh, at about 0.17, which yes, is the yes. critical temperature. Um, yes, I think that's right, what you just said. Um, yeah. So you get more correlation uh, in the superfluid. I think the important thing is the sudden jump there, which uh, is quite convincing. One of the nice aspects of this is the, the precision measurement of, uh, of the universal contact. And you compared it to some of the theoretical results and said, well, it compares nicely with some and not so nicely with others. Mm -hmm. Could you say anything about what you think is the characteristic of those theoretical methods. Maybe it'd be good to return to that slide that, yeah. that makes some of them successful and others less successful in, uh, in getting a good value of the contact, assuming, as we all do, of course, that your experiment, experimental result is correct. <laughs> okay, so there's reasonable agreement here with uh, these results and not so good agreement with these results. Um, this is what you're asking, this is the question. Well, okay, so, 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 so T matrix, I don't know what that means about how you actually do the, exper do, do, do the calculations, but they seem to, to agree and to give pretty good, uh, uh, agree with each other and to have pretty good agreement with the latest uh, uh, measurements that you made. Uh, um, of course, the, the, the other measurements, well, they're within two standard deviations. Uh, of the, uh, of the present measurement, so that's probably fine too. Uh, the theorists never give us any uh, uncertainty, so we don't know what, uh, <laughs> they should, but they don't. Uh, so we don't know what, what to think of that. But I'm just wondering whether in thinking about this you have any, any ideas about whether, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 about the, the efficacy of these, uh, of these theoretical methods. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Up until very recently, it was very much in the air, up in the air, which, uh, which pair would, would be the better, because yeah. <laughs> they obviously aren't the same. Um, we think we've resolved that, uh, but I can't say more than that. I mean, we, Hugh, who did these calculations, we, all, we really should get together and just discuss it with him, but we haven't had time. It's just happened very quickly. Yeah. I'm just thinking, um, you know, quantum Monte Carlo has been a very powerful method yeah. for doing all kinds of stuff. What's yeah. wrong with it? Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> More questions? Comments? Oops. So let's thank Professor Peter. <laughs>